Okay, this is the final video then for uh, May 2018 time zone 2 higher level uh, IB chemistry paper 1. So question 31, what are the major products of electrolyzing concentrated aqueous potassium iodide? Well, you've got K, what have we got as ions present? We've got K plus, we've got I minus and it's in water. So we've also got H plus and OH minus. Now, K plus potassium is more reactive than hydrogen, which means potassium is happier being a positive ion than hydrogen is. So hydrogen is discharged in preference. We usually get hydrogen with aqueous solutions unless it's a very unreactive metal. So that will be positive ions attracted to the negative electrode. What about at this one? Well, technically hydroxide is discharged in preference over other ions. However, unless it's a very, very dilute solution of a halide ion, we will get the halide. So the fact that it's concentrated, uh, you always get the halide in preference to hydroxide. So I- minus is an example of a halide from group 7 or 17. So we're going to get iodine and not oxygen produced from the hydroxide ions. So we're going to go with iodine there. If it was a very, very dilute solution, then yes, we would get oxygen produced from the hydroxide ions. So that would be B. Thirty-two. Which compounds belong to the same homologous series? Well, let's see if we can sketch some of these out. So this first one here, uh, we can see we've got a lot of unsaturation there. So that's basically HC, and then we've got a triple bond C CH two CH three. So that's but one ion and alkyne. And then the next one, okay, we've got again a triple bond by the looks of it. I'm going to see CH2, CH2, CH3. So one, two, three, four, five. So that's pent one ion. So this is looking good. They're both alkynes. The next one here, well, this is an alcohol and this is an ether. So although they're structural isomers of each other, it looks like it with four carbons of four carbons, they're not the same homologous series. Alcohol versus ether, so not that one. And uh, this one, this is an alkane. It's CNH2N plus two, but this uh, looks like an alkene. So that first one there would be the double bond, and then the CH3, whereas the next one is just one, two, three, four. So it's not that one, it's an alkene and an alkane. And then this next one, well, that looks like a ketone. So that is propanone, and that is an ether. So we've basically got a ketone versus an ether. So it's not that one, so it's the first one with these two alkynes. What is the name of this compound using IUPAC rules? Okay, so find the longest chain, start at the carboxylic acid, one, two, three, and then four. So although they put a bit of a dog leg, dog leg in it to confuse you into thinking that it's propanoic acid, it's actually four carbons in the longest chain. So that will be butanoic acid, and there's a methyl group on position three, so it will be D. Of course, we could have called that position four, and then this would have been the methyl group on position three equally. Which are structural isomers? Well, we've got ethanol and methoxymethane. So those are structural isomers of each other. That works. Uh, this one, they've just written it differently. They're both ethanol, basically. It's just they've kind of drawn this molecule kind of the other way. So not that one because they're the same molecule. And then this one, okay, we've got uh, ethanoic acid and methyl methanoate. Well, they've got the same number of carbons, oxygens, and hydrogens. It's just one of them is this. And the other one is that with the hydrogen on that carbon there. So those are structural isomers. So it's one and three only, which will be B. 36, which is the correct combination of substitution reaction mechanisms? Well, here we've got benzene undergoing electrophilic aromatic substitution. You need to know that, but of course, you know, so like it grabs a chlorine, you get the horseshoe shape. And then it loses a hydrogen ion to get the delocalized ring of electrons back again. So uh, that would be electrophilic aromatic substitution. And then what we've got here, well, ignore the benzene part. It's basically we're reacting an alkane with chlorine, which would require the presence of ultraviolet light. So this is a free radical uh, substitution or free radical halogenation uh, of an alkane. So it would be this one here. 23. Propene is reacted first with hydrogen chloride to produce X, and then react with aqueous sodium hydroxide to give Y. Finally, Y is reacted with excess acidified potassium dichromate. What is the major product? Okay, well, if this is propene, now when we react that with HCl, we've got two possibilities, because that's going to grab the hydrogen off the chlorine and kick the chlorine out. So we could get 
the hydrogen attached to this carbon and then the positive charge on here, that would be a carbocation. And then the chloride would come in with its lone pair of electrons and give us this intermediate as X. Alternatively, we could attach the hydrogen to this one and then put the positive charge out here. And then the chloride would come in with its lone pair of electrons and give us the chlorine on that end carbon. Now, the more stable carbocation is the more substituted one. So this carbocation has got two carbons attached. This one's only got one directly attached to it. So this is the more stable carbocation. So this is going to be the major product X. When we hydrolyze that with sodium hydroxide, we'll get this alcohol. And then when we oxidize that with dichromate, we'll get this ketone. So our answer is B. Okay. Because uh, that's the intermediate product. Uh, y not z and then of course these would have come from this this one here which is the minor product the minor product would hydrolyze to give propan 1 all which would then oxidize to propanal and then it could oxidize further to uh because there's too many carbons there actually isn't it? yeah i don't think you get this one anyway because there's too many carbons there you'd have to react with cyanide first and then hydrolyze that so that's a bit of a nonsense one which isomers exist as non-superimposable non mirror images? So you need to recognize, right, that's enantiomers, basically. So when you get a pair of enantiomers, that's your non-superimposable mirror images. Structural isomers, are, you know, sort of, they don't differ on their 3D spatial arrangement as such. They've just got the atoms are joined up in a different sort of order. So, uh, so they're very different from each other. Cis-trans isomers is, of course, when we've got carbon-carbon double bonds or potentially ring structures with uh, groups trapped on the same side of the ring or opposite sides of the ring. Diastereoisomers is where a molecule has got two chiral centers, and then what you have is one of the chiral centers is the same in both of them, but then the other chiral center is different. And that means you can actually separate those uh, quite easily. So diastereoisomers contain two chiral centers, and then if you have a diastereoisomer, diastereoisomeric pair, one of the chiral centers is the same, the other chiral center is different, and that allows you to separate them. So we're going to go with enantiomers. Thirty-eight. How are the uncertainties of two quantities combined when the quantities are multiplied together? Well. What we need to do is find those percentage uncertainties and then add them together. So we'd want to be going with this one. If it was say, and if they're added or subtracted together, then we would simply just take the uncertainties and add them together. So this would be correct if the sum was then an addition or a subtraction. But if it's a multiplication or a division, we need to find the percentage uncertainties by doing the absolute uncertainty divided by the true measured value times 100 and add them together to give the percentage uncertainty. 39. Uh, the rate of a reaction is studied at different temperatures, which is the best way to plot the data. Well, if we're changing temperature and measuring rate, well, if we're changing temperature, then temperature is our independent variable. And uh, independent variables would go on the x-axis. So our independent variable would be the temperature because that's what we would be changing okay so you always put the independent variable on the x-axis dependent on the y and we're changing temperature measuring rate so it will be c and then the last one uh it's been removed for copyright reasons all these uh so that doesn't help the infrared spectrum of low density polyethylene high density polyethylene da, 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 shown below which spectrum is ptfe well, you'd be looking for the spectrum which doesn't have any CH bonds. And the CH bonds occur at around about 3,000, uh, a little lower, a little lower than 3,000 centimetres to minus one as a kind of a jagged uh, kind of peak in that region, around about sort of the 3,000 mark. So whichever one doesn't have those, because you've just got the carbon fluorine bonds, which would appear more to the right. In fact, there's not going to be a lot going on to the left of this one because it's just carbon-carbon bonds and carbon fluorine bonds. So you're looking for the one which doesn't have the, the kind of jagged CH bonds. That's how I'd do it if the, the images were there. Okay. Hope that was useful, folks.